All right, we're live. Hey, Rod. Hey, Rachel. <laughs> so we're just talking a little bit about your class at CCA yes. and what they go through. So you said it was 15 weeks? Yeah, it's based on the 15-week semester that they have at CCA. And, and you produce a full character set or more than that? Yeah, so um, the typical outcome for the course for each uh, designer, each contributing student, is um, a really strong core concept as a base font and then some adjunct concepts, um, sort of exploratory styles, weights, um, the more experimental, the better, in my opinion. I love yeah. <laughs> when someone breaks the typical, you know, um, model, you know, regular italic, bold, bold italic. That's all great. But if we can do something um, multidimensional or whatever, that's that's all the better, more fun. Um, and well, then, the work that we saw when in your class when we came up was phenomenal. They were doing excellent work. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would concur. You know, it's amazing what... Um, what what the students are capable of it's an upper division course at tca and so people mm -hmm. come in like in super good shape like ready to go and to create amazing things i'm super inspired by the class all the time yeah awesome. i think you came um it was like towards maybe the end of the semester before i can't quite remember hmm. but it was great to have you there uh, yeah i think it was yeah yeah you and michael had great um feedback on the designs. That was really handy. Well, it's easy when the work is really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're waiting for people to file in. Looks like we've got about seven. Um, hi, guys. Welcome to Topography Dojo. Just waiting for people to file in. So what I'd like you to do is on the right-hand side, there's a chat bar. Let me say something really quick. There you go, it's right there. Um, I'd like to know, we'd like to know, uh, what you drink first thing in the morning. Is it tea or coffee or something else? Let's see if we can get some responses here. How about you, Rod? What do you drink in the morning? Um, I drink water. <laughs> you drink water. <laughs> I drink water and I, every day I make a, um, a weird concoction, a smoothie, like a protein and vegetable fruit slurry pretty much i call it um my nutra slurry <laughs> nutra slurry yeah and that's my food for most of the day actually so i'm on like i guess technically now that i think of it i'm on a bit of a liquid diet for part of my day yeah. oh well that makes it easy right <laughs> it's actually we it's, have some yeah it's not some sort of like well I'm, it's mostly a bachelor thing even though i'm married um it's easier to throw stuff into a thing and hit a button to blend it than it is to cook anything. So right. it's, it's just convenience mainly. Yeah. You don't need a stove. Yeah. Who needs a stove? So hi, Erica. She says coffee. Deb says Nesquik. Nice. Diego says water. Renee says tea. I myself am kind of a coffee person, sometimes yeah. tea, but yeah. I, I like to uh, I like to do the smoothie thing, but it's uh, if there's more than three ingredients, it's like too much work for me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've started actually creating little kits that I freeze that have like everything pre-mixed. Not everything, but really, mostly. yeah, to make it even quicker to to kind of process in the morning. So just to throw that's, that out. That's great. Yeah. Eva says as long as it has caffeine. Yeah, that's game. <laughs> <laughs> well answered. Yeah. Okay, so guys, we're going to get started here. Welcome to Topography Dojo. This is where we explore type and topography with design masters. My guest today is the amazing type designer and type obsessive, Rod Cavazos. It, yeah. If you have any questions for him, underneath here, there's a, a tab called Questions and Topics. Please add your questions there. We'll answer them at the end. I just noticed I have this weird blue light coming from my microphone. Just in case you think something is I'm You're, having some sort of laser issue. <laughs> no, this is like a miracle. Um, it's really here. weird. Right. Um, so I'm Rachel Elner, um, your host of today's session. Um, I'm the producer of Type Ed here in Los Angeles, where we educate designers about the importance of topography. Rod, would you like to in introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, uh, my name is Rod, and I am, as Rachel mentioned, a 
Well, I would actually switch the order. I'm a type obsessive. And oh, type obsessive first. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I'm so glad you said that. It, it's, it's quite apt. Um, a type designer by trade. That's, that's my, my day job, even though it doesn't feel like a job to me. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I have the privilege of teaching at uh, California College of the Arts, the type design studio there. Now coming into its 10th year this year, which is kind Oof. of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, um, I'm, I'm chatting to y'all from sunny, yeah, pretty sunny downtown San Francisco, right here off, right off Market Street. So, Rod, you spoke at one of my type events here in Los Angeles almost a year ago, actually. And since yeah. then, I've gotten to know and admire your work um, and your acute and totally whimsical approach to designing typefaces. I was wondering if you can just show us a little bit about where you are. Um, show us, talk about the posters possibly behind you. Oh, yeah. OK, so um, I'm just nestled into our, our little cozy office here. Um, Rachel, you've been here. It's not so much an office as it is kind of a lounge um, area yeah. um, or lounge space. And so um, behind me, well, we have some posters that um, from are from a recent um, show. Uh, it was called Getting Upper. It was curated by um, Amos Klausner. And it was all about doing something really fun with one letter of the alphabet. A letter was assigned to... Um, one of 26 designers, we got the letter X. That's the one that you see oh, cool. up in the corner there, kind of a op art X. And then two more in the series, we put them up as a set here. Um, this was Martin Vineski's poster for the letter M. Bob Alfeldish's poster for the letter K. He's such a rebel, he turned his K sideways. Can you all see that? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. But none of that stuff matters as much as the plush letters that are behind me and actually all around me. I'm, I'm like I'm covered with these things. They're like tribbles, I guess. They sort of multiply. Um, anyway, our studio. these guys represent our studio pretty well. Just like silly, whimsical, letter-based stuff that we like to collect or create. Um, this was just a fun thing we created ourselves. Love those. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I would love to actually just have a whole pile of them and jump into them. Yeah, it's like, it's super therapeutic, actually. It, it, it could be like, it, it could be, uh, it could be just what the world needs. It's just like cuddling letters. That would like set everything straight. Yeah, yeah nice of course. squishy letters. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you how you got started in, in type design. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I've had a bit of an or, unorthodox um, trajectory within the, this realm. Um, it's sort of an old world model, uh, not as opposed to a more modern formal approach. Um, I, I sort of willed myself into graphic design about 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> um, started working in a print shop actually as a production assistant and I um, mm. was really lucky to have an amazing um, mentor there, or a creative director who was working, was, um, you know, hand letter, um, cartoonist, printmaker. And um, he was kind enough to put up with me, take me under his wing. And so I, I sort of got my start in the form of a mentorship uh, to begin, begin with there. And then pretty much a sequence of other amazing sort of connections with, with people who, who were happy to share their knowledge with me. Um, and um, yeah, I worked- Well, did you start PsyOps right away or? No, I, so I, I started in the late eighties just working in, in design. This was pre-digital um, days. Um, and then it was in the early nineties when I realized I really just wanted to focus on type um, in whatever capacity. Um, I sort of geared my practice once I started it towards, you know, creating word marks, logo types. And then I realized I just wanted to work on pure type. And so in 1994, I, I decided to, to do that. Just like tell my client base that uh, I was going to be moving on and 
I just um, set up a studio that would be based entirely on on creating type. Hmm. Yep. And uh, speaking of logo marks, you you worked on the medium uh, logo refresh, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I was uh, privileged to sort of be on uh, part of the team that um, worked on that. It was the in-house team, and mm -hmm. so I contributed, uh, you know, from my from my angle. Um, that was last fall, and yeah, it was it was a it was a great engagement. Um, the uh, it was a good reminder too, because I am um, ninety eight percent of the time working on typefaces. Mm -hmm. And it really made me appreciate <laughs> how um, directed that whole workflow is, like creating a typeface. The functional parameters of creating a font or a set of fonts um, are such that it's pretty focused. You create a logo type, and it's just about um, the sky being the limit. There's, there's so much that goes on. There's so much, so much psychology and um, lots of layers to consider. And so occasionally we do work on, on projects um, along those lines. It always just makes, and I enjoy them, I really do, but it makes me um, appreciate all the more the purity, you could say, of just working on pure type. Yeah. I know you were working on some type uh, projects with H&M. Did you work on the logo type for that as well? No, so the H&M was actually um, uh, spearheaded by longtime friend and collaborator, Stefan Hattenbach, who's uh, mm -hmm. uh, based in Stockholm. Um, he's a, uh, a dedicated type designer. He's, he's created a lot of amazing work um, over the years. And so the um, the H&M project uh, was originated on his side. The, letter, the, the project itself was such that um, H&M had, uh, had been using hand letters for, for their signage and and all their collateral, uh, which is really awesome. But it, uh, as the company grew, you know, it started as, uh, you know, a smaller entity and then became a, a global presence, um, you know, the hand letters couldn't keep up with all, all their needs. So they, they had to make the jump to digital. And so that was actually more of a Stefan initiated project. And we helped with the, on the production side, um, Every project has its own ins and outs. That one um, stands out in that they had this, they were using some sort of proprietary um, like price tag or labeling system that had to work, mm -hmm. that worked in a very weird or antiquated way. So we had to actually build a font that accommodated that. And it was, it, it was um, not quite the same as a font that we would use day to day. It, it had to be built for these weird parameters. So, yeah. <laughs> Always something, right? With client yeah. work. <laughs> it keeps it fun anyway. Yeah. Yes, like fun it. is a good word. <laughs> so, guys, what we're going to do on this call is um, Rod has is going to give away $100 of credit towards fonts at the PSYOP site. Um, and we'll give it away to um, a, a drawing. We'll have a drawing of people who ask questions. So every question will go into a drawing. And then at the end, well, obviously, when we're finished with the call, then we'll give away $100 of credit for fonts on uh, for the PSYOP site. Sorry. Yeah. You um, got it. Okay. So. And the $100 is loosey-goosey. If you, if you happen to go over by 20 bucks, what can we do, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's your advantage. So go ahead and uh, think about questions while Rod's talking and make sure on the bottom underneath here, I'm pointing right here because it's right here on me, but yeah. is that the questions and topics tab. Go ahead and, and uh, put in your questions and then we'll answer them at the end. <clears throat> so Rod, I want to ask you a little bit about something I'm always interested in is the typeface design process. So I was wondering if you can tell me what it takes to design a typeface or a font. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, a lot of that is qualified by what the goal is, um, you know, what the intention, the final intention is for, for a given design. Um, and so, of course, that can run the gamut from from something um, expeditious and quick for, for like a little spot project to something really major, hyper technical um, and expansive, mm -hmm. you know. So. I'm sure you know we want to talk about the font pop um, side of things, which is the more accessible um, 
uh, approach. And so um, for that, I mean, the best starting point is just a concept that you love, something that that is, um, you know, that hits a mark, whether it's for a project or just something you want to work on independently, just explore. The main thing is to, to find, to create some core artwork that you just um, really resonate with. Um, a lot of times there's sort of this, this notion that um, what you start with, the artwork that you start with has to be immaculately drafted. Um, and that d never hurts to be able to do multiple drafts by hand. Um, and, and again, this assumes that you're starting with a sketch or some sort of drawn reference. Um, it never hurts to have something um, that, that it's super well drafted, but it is not an obligatory thing. You don't, you don't need to have that. It becomes a stumbling block for a lot of people. And so um, part of the focus of, of doing these sort of um, workshops is showing people how to just jump in with artwork that is less than perfect, whatever that might mean, and to um, take advantage of the uh, di digital tools to create the, the perfection, as it were, you know, the higher sort of drafting standards that you need. Um, mm. So I think, um, again, for a lot of people, it feels like, well, if my letters aren't perfect, um, then why bother? <laughs> or, you know, whatever. So just knowing that, it, you know, you can start with something fairly wobbly, you know, just raw material. Think of, think of letters in terms of, of clay that you're going to sculpt. They don't need to be... Um, fully sculpted before you, you jump them into the digital side uh, of things. Anyway. Do you have any examples to show? I'm not sure if we have any examples or. Yeah, um, let's see. Well, you know, um, see if I can pull up some okay. class images. So at CCA, you know, we, we do this, we, we kind of, um, we do a, a, a baptism by fire, like jump in pretty early on. Um, so let me find, I mean, this will just be some sketch. Samples. Sure, yeah, anything is helpful. I mean, when we talk about topography, it's great to do it just talking, but sometimes visuals definitely help. Yeah, um, so let me try a screen share here. Okay. So this is just, you know, some examples of uh, early concepting. I actually don't have anything that's a little more refined um, than this, but um, in the case of the, the type design studio at CCA, we start by just uh, wide open um, concepting, just insane letter drawing um, with no judgment and no preciousness at all. And we, and we quickly have to choose in, each student does um, a concept to sort of start building out and, and refining. So can you see this? Did it share? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a, an example of- Actually, of if you can- Zoom in. If you can zoom it up a little bit, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yay. By, by the end of the first <laughs> week, we have like thousands of drawings like this collectively. And it's like one of the happiest things. <laughs> um, and, and then we just, we have to quickly narrow down because we have a fixed time span. And so what would be the next phase from this is just pulling the concepts that are most favored and, and redrawing them with the focus being on the form, not on, mm. on the like edge work or the perfection of, uh, certain details, just trying to get the, the general qualities of proportions and scale and dimensions, um, you know, set up, shut that off there. Um, cool. And so then um, even a, a, um, a sketch that is, is pretty wobbly um, is plenty good to initiate the digital side of things. The most important thing is just having a vision in your head of what you might want to accomplish with it. And so um, again, no problem to draw and redraw as much as you might want to or have time to, but it's not the only path. Yeah. 
Um, one, it's great. I love to see those sketches. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I wish I had some later phases. Where this is actually where we're at now, or just we're just beyond mm -hmm. this. But I don't have any images on the screen. Um, I do have some final outcome images that maybe we can look at later. But really, I'm, I, I mentioned this. You know, I alluded to sculpture. That's sort of the the best sort of analog I have for for working on this is just bringing in forms and then standardizing in in layers, iterative sort of um, passes where we you, you kind of refine the details and create cohesiveness uh, and balance, whatever's needed to pull it all together. Um, and I read I, that type design actually is suited around just a few characters. I mean, there's a couple characters that actually determine the, the design of the whole alphabet. Is that true or no? Well, it depends on the design, but yeah, there are definitely kind of some model letters that, um, mm. that you can focus on and they become building blocks or, um, mm -hmm. Exemplars for for the other letters. Um, that's mm. that's totally true. Yeah, but you don't work that way. Um, we do. Um, once we're, we're oh. on the digital side, uh, to sort of continue answering your question about like the process. Mm -hmm. Once we have yeah. vectors or contours going, um, and we we start uh, redrafting or sculpting or both our letter forms. Um, in the course of doing that, we start really crystallizing the design itself, deciding what we want it to look like. And then um, certain letters, you know, you can imagine some of the common ones, the letter I becomes a building block for, for so many other letters in a, in a kind of a standard garden variety sans serif for serif typeface. Um, the letter O becomes the poster child for, you know, the curved letters, the C, Q, G to begin with, the capitals. Um, and, and, you know, from there you can sort of build out whatever else is needed. Um, it, and every project is different. There is no singular path, of course, just to, not to overstate that, but, um, you know, in our course at CCA, we do allow a lot of latitude um, so that each design can take its proper kind of optimal course. Um, I provide guidance on that, but I really like to have the designers sort of, you know, let that be their own reveal as they work through. Yeah. So, well, I have two questions. One is that, so what are the digital tools you usually use to build out typefaces? Um, so we, our, our core tool here is uh, Font Lab Studio uh, 5 uh, at the studio. Um, at school, at CCA, we've been we've used it for the majority of years. Um, the last two years or so, we switched over to Type Tool, um, and found it to be you know a, a, a nimble, usable tool, um, a more affordable one for the students. That's that's uh, always a nice factor uh, or consideration for them, um, and and that's probably why we also decided to, to use it for these um, for the font pop workshops. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's affordable and it's it, the curve. It, uh, Font Lab is, um, you know, it's akin to fo Photoshop and then it has a ton of bells and whistles, lots of advanced sorts of things. They're great if you need them. For most people, they don't. And so you're, you end up paying for something that has a lot of features that won't be used, um, most likely. And they just kind sure. of also get in the way a little bit, so... Um, Got it. My, yeah. Okay, so my other question, my second question, so my first question was about digital. My second question is about analog. So you started in the 80s. How were you developing typefaces back in the photo typesetting days? Yeah, so, um, you know, my first work with, with, um, with type was, you know, hand drawing and using a stat camera. So like photo type, um, in essence. Um, and... Uh, in the end, the principles are pretty much the same. Uh, styles and tastes have changed, but the, you know, kind of the same core compositional principles are still applicable. Um, and if it isn't clear by now, based on what we've been talking about so far, I, I love starting by hand. Um, I encourage people to do that. I know designers who, who can jump in on the on the contour side. You know, just go straight into vectors and create amazing things from their heads and that's way cool. Um, 
but being able to, to originate a drawing by hand, just sort of kick out a, a sketch, work it up into a comp, redraft it as you might want, want to, um, still works great. And by, by the time I started doing type more um, in the late 80s, um, Fontographer was, you know, was already out. It was, it was out from the mid 80s. I jumped in in oh. about 88 um, and started playing with it. You can use that for um, about 10 years. And then uh, and the technology, has it changed a lot from the 80s till now? No. <clears throat> they're, they're, oh, no. <laughs> in, com compared to just about any other field you can think of tech technologically or technically, mm -hmm. um, type digital type has been um, pretty glacial in, in, in its advancement or lack thereof. Um, you know, open type kicked in, um, you know, 12, 15 years ago, and that, that kind of expanded the possibilities. Um, but in the overall scope of things, it's, it, there has been a, a lot of change. Um, I'm, I'm sure that could be nitpicked, you know, with different things. Um, but but I would, that's my take on it. I will say, you know, we're about to enter a fun new realm with um, tools like Font Self, which uh, some of you might want to check out. That actually just launched last week. Um, and it's pretty much a Photoshop plugin that lets you um, take artwork, you know, you create some vector forms or some drawn forms and trace them in Illustrator and pretty much select them and assign them to um, a character range, capital A to Z, lowercase a to Z, numerals and symbols. And it will, it will create a font, a quick um, font on the fly. Like you, you pretty much really? click a button, yeah, and um, and it'll execute. Um, it'll create an open type font. And they're working on uh, what's what's really cool is is the next phase um, of font self is they're they're working on color fonts. That's brewing on a couple of different front fronts. Um, you know, the different standards are being tested and tried, and and they'll eventually come into play. They'll, they'll become available in the same way that web fonts did in the last um, set of years, you know? Um, so that that's coming around. It'll be really interesting to see what happens with that. That's going to be a phase shift. So I just posted the URL in the chat. So if anyone's interested, this is, I hope this is correct, Rod. Fontself.com, is that correct? I think okay. that's it. Yeah. That's, uh, that's okay. it. uh, Franz okay. Hoffman's project. Ah. So. Uh, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, if you watch the demo. And um, again, you know, for now, it's just taking vectors in Illustrator and and kind of um, building a quick font. Uh, minimal controls. I know they'll be amping all that up. It's it, This isn't intended for heavy-duty use, but in the spirit of, you know, like the font pop workshop that we're doing, it creates accessibility and, um, and it, you know, it just creates another channel for for designers you know where you can integrate right, right. lettering so as just a, a reminder we're going to be giving away a hundred dollars credit to any to the psyops uh library so please uh, submit a question underneath and uh one hundred dollar credit will go will be given away to one question so submit a question <laughs> guys yeah <laughs> um uh, so there was a, um, a self-type face, I don't know, a font generator by Adobe that was released just recently. Did you see that? Yeah, I've actually been talking a little bit with them about that. Um, um, it's uh, Project Faces, I, I think you're right. um, referring Project to. Project Faces, that's right. That's yeah, right. also very interesting. And your thoughts? <laughs> well, um, I have mixed feelings uh, if I'm – perfectly honest about it it's certain for anyone who hasn't seen it you can you can um probably find a, a video on the adobe site or on youtube um i think they, they debuted it at the adobe max conference at the um, adobe max yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it's yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much um it's it's kind of a um a system where where you can control the attributes of, of a base typeface a base font in any of the ways that you normally 
uh, normally you would do by building out instances or weights, fonts. This gives you sort of infinite intermediate control over things like weight and width and um, other attributes. And so it lets you create a custom sort of um, font or you know a type treatment for uh, whatever particular setting you might be needing to fill. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th th of course, <clears throat> you know, from a type design perspective, it feels like the kind of automation that could, that could end up, um, you know, uh, overriding the craft of manually creating type, to put it one way. Right. Um, right. My whole thing is, um, you know, this stuff is coming. It's, it's, it, it's here to mainly help designers. I, I do not want to be the, uh, the buggy whip maker. Um, from 120 years ago, you know, who shook a fist at um, automobiles, you know, uh, <laughs> be a Luddite. Um, and so, and my whole take on on type, you know, letter making and type creation is uh, the process is way fun. And I, I, the more people who can enjoy it, the better, you know. So, yeah, it'll yeah, be interesting it's... to see what, what happens with project faces, or I think we're going to have a chat I know. soon. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, and actually, I think what it does nicely is that um, it it separates the field and the typefaces that you guys develop over at PsyOps that are much more interesting, have more character to it, more whimsy. That's not what Project Faces is trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's not a it's not a direct sort of uh, it's not a direct replacement or intended replacement for existing typefaces. Um, you know, it, it's intended as, um, if nothing else, uh, like a template type um, where you've got a layout and you know you're going to have to find a, a certain treatment and you can you can mock up with it. It's, it's sort of like detailed greeking. Um, you, you can put in uh, the type and adjust the weight and the, uh, you know, the color of it and everything. And then later on, you can come back with something that's that's more you know, final and dedicated with some personality. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's the one thing it's hard, you know, it, it, with typefaces, they are all about, you know, the, the personality, the individual quirks right. and styling. So they're not, they're not right. aiming to capture or replace that. Like that's, right. that's, right. it's too wide open to begin with. Yeah. Right. So I just want to ask the last question about the workshop. So we are, uh, co-hosting a workshop with you called Font Pop. And the link is actually, again, underneath the video. So if you want to check out the Font Pop design workshop with Rod, we're holding it on March 12th, from what I can remember. Yeah, right? that's it. And, um, and attendees will be getting a pack of fonts. Uh, and, and so they'll be able to walk away with some of Rod's best designs. Uh, but, and we're also going to have a discount for the next week. If you're interested, it's going to be 10% off. And then just use the referral code type dojo, T Y P E D O J O. Yeah, that's a tricky one. I'll just one. type it in on the side, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. So type dojo for 10% off. And then students will get 20% off for the next week, which is type dojo student. Um, so I'll just type that in on the side. But if you're interested in registering and working with Rod, he'll be here in March. Rod, do you want to tell me a little bit about what students are going to walk away with in terms of what they'll learn in the workshop? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the, the font pop format um, is about as concentrated a dose of, you know, <laughs> uh, information as you can get in this in within this field. And the information that we're going to be what we're going to be working with is based on, you know, 10 years of of trying different things, uh, different workflows, and focusing on different principles that that help clarify like why a letter might work or why it might not. Um, and so um, it's a partial, partially hands-on um, session, um, six hours, hitting the high points, trying some hands-on exercises, um, and uh, enough to the point where you can you can then go away and and apply those techniques to a dedicated design to a, to a project that you might want to work on. Um, 
So it's not the kind of class where you'll come away with a finished font. That would be um, super tricky. We'd have to warp time or something to, to make that happen. Um, but we will um, just hit what I call or what I think of as the high points, the things that, that, are, that really help um, guide the way in, a, in linear fashion from start to finish. Um, it's intended for, you know, for folks who might want to just be able to take a piece of hand lettering and, and create a quick application for, for a poster or for, you know, mm -hmm. a book even. So it's, it's the first kind of jump in. If people, if people wanted to sell their font after, I mean, obviously they're not going to walk away with a full alphabet, but say they develop the full alphabet. How do they go about selling their typeface or their font? Right. Um, yeah. And so if you do come up with something that you want to market, there are a lot of avenues for that these days. Um, and, you know, just a little bit of research it would, would show you a couple of good forums. I mean, um, my fonts is sort of the most universal repository of, you know, uh, commercial typefaces. And so you can always submit to them. Um, there are, you know, a lot more independent name your price sorts of uh, places that you could consider as well. Mm. So lots of channels, lots of avenues. Um, if you, if you want to have something to publish commercially in, in, you know, just in all truth, you may not have that full measure when you come out of the, the workshop. There are some technical things that you, that we won't get into that are usually good to take care of. Um, we're focusing more on, on core kind of process and, and information. And so, um, you know, there, there are some phases that um, you may want to get some, do some more research on before you finally commit to a commercial design. A 1.0. But Ron, after, afterwards, say a couple months down the road, someone finishes a full font and they want to sell it and they have questions, they can contact you, right, to see maybe what some of the technical issues might be to before submitting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple of things. When we do a workshop, and I don't remember if we <laughs> stated this explicitly in the description, but um, part of participating in, in our workshops, we do intensives and, and certain other things, is that you're automatically, you know, lined up to get some consult time from us down the road, if that if that's useful to you. So you, you can mm -hmm. follow up, and and um, we're happy to kind of chime in and and provide some support on that. Great. Yeah, we do that. But just to mention at our studio, we do that in general for the industry where we're sort of a hub, a support hub for a lot of other designers, um, whether they're just starting out or, you know, veterans. Um, we're really good at technical uh, stuff, troubleshooting and resolving weird mystery problems. And so, um, you know, for example, my fonts, people come to us when they've got an issue and um, we do our best to, to get a quick uh, resolution for them. But, Anyone who does one of our workshops gets extra special preferential <laughs> treatment in that regard. I did hear through the grapevine that you guys were the go-to for certain issues like that. So yeah, and and great. We're, we're always happy to to kind of be of service in, in that way. Yeah, great, great. So let's uh, answer some questions. Unless there's anything else. Let's yeah, see. we can jump into questions. Did we miss anything? Okay. Okay, so I'll just start. I'll just read them to you, and then you can answer them as we go. Sure. Okay, I got guys. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them underneath the questions and topics tab. All right. So we'll start with the first one from Chanel. Hello, Chanel. By the way, where do you find your inspiration? Any odd sources? Are there any type designers you personally follow? Yeah. So <clears throat> inspiration is everywhere, as we know. Um, especially, you know, in, in a spot like downtown San Francisco, um, you know, choose an alley or, a, 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 you know, a neighborhood and you'll, you'll find all sorts of historic treasures, you know, ghost type and, um, you know, just residual things layered over with 
graph lettering and everything else, um, which ties in with Nikki's um, session she did on uh, the Typography Dojo. Um, highly recommended. She, she talks about that kind of thing. So anyway, our surroundings, our environment, it's full of inspiration. Um, a lot of times inspiration comes um, from accidents, you know, uh, unintended sort of uh, flubs on a, on a certain project that's being worked on. Um, a lot of times you get some weird new thing that inspires its own sort of offshoot, make a little sketch note for it later. Um, I personally get inspired by words and names. They, uh, a word or a name can evoke a design. And um, I love playing with that myself. So, um, yeah, um, the, the thing that works best for me is just free drawing. You know, if, if, I, if I feel like I have a certain direction or whatever, but I don't, I don't have a specific goal, um, just start with something. Every idea leads to three more, and then you can mm -hmm. multiply out from there. And so um, just free doodling in the way that I showed that those sheets from um, the start of our semester at CCA, um, that always yields something. You know, just draw a line, draw another line. Um, connect it. What does it look like? Add something here, add something there, take something off and just kind of play right. with it. Yeah. Right. You know, it must, it's, I know that it's, um, let's see, rush hour because I hear honking outside your window and honking outside my window. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought that, that was thing. kind of interesting. Right. I'm, so, I'm happy um, so no ambulances there... have come by. <laughs> That's good. Emergency vehicles. Are, yeah. are there any type designers that you follow or that you admire? Oh, yeah. I mean, way more than I can list, um, for sure. Um, and I almost don't want to start naming names because I'll leave out, um, Somebody. <laughs> yeah, I'll be kicking myself afterwards, but for sure there, are, you know, some giants in the field that I'd love. Um, I, I just admire greatly. Um, you know, Susanna Lichko is, is a huge inspiration. She kind of kicked it off for all of us. Um, really, you know, 30 years ago, which is, crazy to think about. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, uh, a lot of the, um, well, we're talking about emigre, a lot of the other emigre designers. And so Bob Malfoldish, I showed his poster up here. Um, you know, he, he does great. Bob was, he was with emigre? Yeah. Yeah. He, he oh. created um, uh, dingbat fonts, a couple of really cool, like postmodern um, mm. feeling. Um, uh, dingbat sets. Um, and we've had the, you know, the privilege of working with Bob directly on some, some revivals of his alphabetic typefaces as well. Um, but you know, people like, um, Xavier Dupre also, you know, president mm -hmm. emigre, um, uh, James Edmondson, who's like an amazing superstar, um, uh, had the privilege of working with him in, in the type design studio. He came through several years ago doing amazing work. Um, and he just started a new foundry last year, right? Yeah. If you haven't checked out, if you don't know James Edmondson, check him out. Um, but he's kicked off his, uh, his type company um, here. It's Oh No. Oh, oh No, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, it, the list goes on. But hopefully that kind of creates a framework. You know, we go back. 30 years, you know, to Suzanne and she's still active and vital doing amazing stuff. Um, and then, you know, through the years, more people, and then there's this amazing generation of, of letter artists and letter masters such as James who, who are, who are just bringing, elevating, um, type and lettering in the world. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Next one. Are there any trends? in commercial type design in your field? And if so, what is driving them? Yeah, okay, so I guess that's a little bit of a segue, you know, from what I was just mentioning about these, these amazing um, um, letter artists who are bringing this, this uh, very refined and experimental, yet experimental um, sensibility to, to type and lettering. Um, and so th we're seeing a lot of really um, ornate and, and 
just beautifully styled scripts and um, mm-hmm. things like that coming about, taking full advantage of uh, what you can do with open type with features. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, the last, I don't know, 10 or so years, um, there's been kind of the best description I have for it is um, Neo Dwiggins ism. If you got, if anyone out there knows, um, William Addison Dwiggins, um, right. book designer, uh, graphic designer. He actually coined the term graphic design in the 20s um, and uh, type designer. Um, he sort of came up with, with a way of, of counterposing, you know, forms, curve and angle and kind of distilling letters down into these these more robust and kind of curious <laughs> shapes, you know, less fussy, less detail mm-hmm. and more, more just kind of strong. Um, which was based on his experimentations with creating puppets, marionettes, um, and realizing that from a distance, you know, he was factoring for viewers watching a puppet show from a distance, that if um, in order to get um, good features on it, on on these puppets that he was carving by hand, that you had to exaggerate and simplify forms, like make it bold or make it, um, kind of go away. And so it's a little bit like stage makeup, you know, performers usually have amplified makeup so that people in, in the mid and, and far distance can capture that. Um, right. And so he, he did these amazing, um, well, he did some kind of straight up designs, but uh, his experimentation was was really fabulous. And he was ahead of his time. Um, the, that sort of general styling has, has um has become a very kind of standard thing to see in different forms, which is what's beautiful. It's, it's really varied, but um, that's, that's kind of uh, a, a thing that pervades. If you look at any of his, of his work, that, the stuff I'm alluding to, and I'm, I don't think I have anything that I can pull up quickly, um, you'll get an okay. idea of what I'm talking about. And so I mentioned, you know, artists like uh, Xavier Dupre. If you look at his work, it, it tends to embody it in a, in a really beautiful way. Um, just, just these amazing sort of uh, chisel strokes, and th- there's like nothing wasted. There's nothing um, weak or um, unconsidered, you know, in, in in its own kind of special way. Yeah, and that's possible because of the technology, because of the open type features. Um, you know, I think it's mainly a visual aesthetic that that sort of kicked in, mm. like. It, it, um, mm. But coupled with open type capabilities, um, yeah, you can do a lot of really amazing sorts of things. The other thing that's coming up too, you know, um, is we talked about colored fonts um, in different forms, um, glyphs, the font development application, which is also fabulous. We use it. We're, we're you know balancing our, our um, we're, we're we're giving it its due in our studio. We're, we're you know super comfortable with Font Lab Studio, but um, we are using glyphs to its amazing advantages as well. And it, so it, it lets you do sort of layered, um, uh, it, it facilitates creating sort of layered stackable um, fonts that you can then sort of style in Illustrator or InDesign or Photoshop um, afterwards. So multi-dimensional, multi-color, multi-tonal things. Um, wow. Coming about. Yeah. yeah, type is coming a long way. Yeah, there's going to be a, a, okay. a blossoming pretty soon. All right, so next question. How are web fonts changing digital topography and what trends can we expect? These are really broad questions. Yeah, well, that one changes directly into what I just mentioned because actually web font, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the whole CSS um, setup that you, you create, that you use for a web page uh, to embed type or to link type, um, it make it actually facilitates stacking color separated fonts and with the CSS mm-hmm. defining the colors and being able to create oh, yeah. cool, rich effects. It's actually easier to do it in CSS than it is in a way within a layout file with, within a illustrated document. Um, mm-hmm. And so if you're going to CSS link one font and color it, you can easily stack two more instances. One adds a drop shadow, another adds an inline, uh, for oh. example. And, and they, you know, they just 
sit over each other and um, work in unison. They're selectable. They're searchable. Um, so, yeah. That's interesting. Um, That's really interesting. How do yeah. we find fonts like that? Um, you can... There, there are a few that I've seen recently. Again, I, none come to mind or, or readily um, That's okay. available. This could be a follow-up item. Uh, if you go, if you go to the Glyphs website, um, and I, I do recommend checking out the software. It's really amazing. Um, they actually have, feature some examples of multi-layered, you know, or uh, yeah, layered and colored type. Um, I think even on their front page. So yeah, check that out. Yeah, I'm going to just paste in the URL. And, you know, Rod is talking about a lot of things here. So what I'm going to do afterwards is send you all show notes. So we have links to everything. This way we don't have to be put on the spot to, show, to share everything. Yeah. So great. Okay, next one. Uh, Judith is saying, I'm designing my first typeface, a revival of a reverse stress wood type. What are your opinions about revivals, historical influence versus creating something new and fresh, being influenced by the digital process? Um, yeah, so uh, revive, reviving a, a design is a great way to, um, well, it's a fun thing to do. You do want to make sure if you're reviving something that it is revivable, you know, that it's not something, that, that it's in the public domain um, and so on. I, I don't really want to get into that too much right now. But, you know, jump back far enough, make sure that um, you're, you're using source art and not um, uh, any sort of mod, more modern interpretation of, the, of that design. And that's part of the beauty of a revival is that everyone brings a, a slightly different quality to a design if multiple people do engage it. Um, that's mm -hmm. also part of doing a revival is you have to know that, you know, someone else might be able to do something that's very similar based on that source art. Um, Again, not something to worry about per se, but worth mentioning. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a it's a great place to be, uh, you know, as a starting point is just find a design that you love and play with it, um, and then make it your own. The more you can make it your own, um, you know, and that can push out into sort of hybriding or you know, exploring another direction or quality to it altogether. You know, bring it bring a new sensibility to it. That's even cooler. Um, yeah. I, I'm really happy to hear that you're doing that, Judith. But I wish you lots of fun with, with the process. Yeah, enjoy it. Thank you, Judith. Uh, okay, so Philip says, how do you suggest for students to dive into the craft of type design, studying old craft and revival for a focus on older craft or due to possible self-generation and innovation. Rod mentioned, should experimentation become more of a focus for newbies attempting to start making type? Yeah, okay, so there, there's, you know, there's no wrong way. It, it, it's, it's of course critical or it's, it's important to, to have a sense of um, historic standards, you know, what what is, um, what we're building on pretty much, you know, what the masters did in past centuries and past decades. Um, and so it's always great to study that. You're, you're not obligated to though. Um, the, the beauty of this whole realm is that it, it's not constrained to one thing or even to 10. So you can, um, you can come at it from an experimental side where you're not concerned with readability, legibility, or, um, you know, whatever, other factors you can you can come in and just do something that's expressive it's textural um and use that as sort of um a starting point to experiment and to get comfortable with the tools and the processes you can always delve back um and, and check out you know historic uh precedents you know and, and get inspiration from them as well but it's it's not it's not required and you should also never feel bad that you don't have that. I encourage you to, to seek it out. But a lot of people feel sort of like, well, I don't know, you know, about Caxton or Baskerville or whatever. You can always come back to that later. Don't let it get in your way for, for now. Yeah. Okay. Philip, I hope we answered your question. And it seems like Philip is coming to your studio at CCA next spring. Oh, right awesome. in the chat. Oh yeah. Hey, Phil, how are you? 
Um, <laughs> I, I hadn't scrolled down. Yeah. So Philip has been able to, to um, what we do uh, meetups, we call them doodle fests. Um, and so um, Phil has been able to join us on a couple. He does very cool letter forms. I'm looking forward to you um, joining the class next year, Phil. That's great. Uh, okay, so Debs ask, hand skilled or digital skilled designers? Mm, Deb, I like for the workshop or just I'm I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Deb, if you're still there, he says in general. She says in general, if you hire someone. Um. Oh yeah, as part of our staff here. Yeah. Um. It would depend on the um, on the position or or the project. Um, that we might need, you know, we could, um, we would team up with a, a calligrapher or letter artist for a certain type of project. Um, and if we needed help on the production side, that would be another sort of basis or no, another requisite. Um, I, it, it's pretty contextual. I would mm -hmm. say um, the, the digital side is, readily learnable. And so if I really had to give a solid answer, you know, just like a, a yes or no, uh, you know, um, I, I would always give a tip of the hat, you know, a big salute to, to hand skilled, uh, as you phrased it, designers. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Deb, I hope we answered your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. She says, awesome. Thanks for the answer. You're welcome. Okay, so Jenny is asking, what are your tips on how to protect your typeface design for beginners? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, okay, so that gets a little bit funky. Um, I, um, let me just speak to sort of the situation here um, in the United States. Um, the, there are different standards around the world, you know, in the, the EU and so on. But pretty much uh, typefaces have um, fairly limited protection within the, you know, what's established in the United States, copyright, um, trademark, and patent. Um, and so you, you have to sort of come at it with, um, without worrying about this kind of thing too much. Technically, it's, it's very possible for people to kind of step on a certain design. It happens frequently. It's a bit of, the, of an underbelly for, for our business. Um, but the, you know, there's it's possible to to take a design and sort of replicate it very closely and legally, though not ethically, to kind of get away with that. You know, to to not have to have any repercussions around that. You, um, in more tangible terms, you know, you're able to um, you're able to protect the code of your design. You're able to actually copyright the binary mm -hmm. code of your font which really interesting. Yeah. You can't, you can't copyright the shape work, um, mm. nor trademark it. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can pretty much, um, uh, boil your the fonts code to out into, or, you know, the, the data into raw code and submit that stack of code and, mm -hmm. and get it copyrighted. And what that does is it, you know, it's defining the, the work based on like the vector constructions, you know, the way it was built, the algorithms that define the shapes and that's, what's protected. And so someone else could, could, you know, auto trace even. And I hope again, it's, it's just like, I don't want to get my blood pressure up here, but um, <laughs> someone can, can do something very close. And as long as they didn't use your, your algorithms, your, your vectors per se, mm -hmm. um, then um, you know, they can actually get away with that. You can trademark the, and then uh, the name of your typeface, you can trademark um, under the, the class that applies to typefaces uh, with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Um, usually most companies don't do that. It's usually the majors who have, you know, in-house lawyers and, and everything who will do that. Um, for the most part, I'd say 95, 90, 95 plus percent uh, of typefaces out there are just, um, informally trademarked, you know, they don't have, they're not registered trademarks. They're just TM'd. Yeah. 
Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, so the the uh, moral of the story is basically design something to your own taste that works with personality, and so it doesn't come close to someone else's. Yeah, and don't freak out if someone does um, yeah. overstep. There's very little you can do. I've I've heard of cases, or you know, and I've, we've dealt with lawsuits and stuff in the past, like trying to get people to stop doing their thing. Um, and it, it's better just to focus on on the constructive side. You know, just don't fret about the piracy side too much and just focus on creating new work, making it stronger and better and enjoying the process really. So, yeah. Good. Thank you, Jenny, for that question. Thank you. <laughs> she says, cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Say, okay, we have two more. We have two more questions. Uh, Eva asks, one of the most interesting and active type form innovation spaces I've seen is street art, particularly in LA. Are you seeing this also are you seeing this also influence modern typeface design? Um, yeah, I, I think there are some good instances where where that's um, that's kind of been folded into you know more traditional type, just bringing that kind of sensibility. A lot of times it's done in a cartoonish way, um, and you know so be it. Um, but I think again with open type, what you can do with it, you can create more expression. Um, and um, character with letter forms, varying shapes, randomizing, things like that. Um, and so it, it's kind of well suited to doing something that has a street art sensibility. Of course, street art is super diverse in, in the styling. You know, um, we all have a sense of what, what that looks like, but in, all, in actuality, it's, it's such a, uh, an amazing wide open realm. Um, it can be a little bit painful to try. I've worked on projects where we, we took um, like graph lettering and, and had to boil it into a font, you know, like distill it down. And, um, and it loses, you know, it loses some of the life. That, that, that's something that, right. that happens actually with most designs. When you go from sketch to digital and you have to really mm -hmm. start deciding how to define an edge as opposed to the fuzzy pencil scrawl that you had in your sketch, you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And, and there, it can be a little bit painful to do that. All the more if you have really expressive letters, letters that kind of stack on or, you know, that sit on themselves, which is a common hallmark of street lettering, a graph writing, um, mm -hmm. you know, that usually requires two layers, one for the base um, and another for the, if the letters have any sort of opening or second color, you have to create a, a second font to overlay um, and do that with. But yeah, I love that. Um, I know, um, um, Hans von Doren did a, a nice series of, of uh, fonts based on graph writing from different major cities around the world. Um, uh, that's cool that's great. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I think it's called Subway. Cool. Could be wrong. Well, we'll look it up and then yeah. we'll list it in the notes. Yeah. So you're not put on the spot here. So. Yeah. He's Thank also, you, Eva. He's also an amazing designer, um, Hans von Doren. Eva says she'll check it out. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Okay, so I don't know why Erica's question is last, but she was like the first one on. <laughs> She's the okay. last one that we're answering. Yeah. yeah, of course. So Erica says, asks, any book suggestions for type designers for either inspiration or guidelines? Um, yeah, so um, the one book that I would recommend highly is um, called Designing Type by Donna Cheng. Uh, C H E N G, I believe. Um, that is a really um, great resource. Um, she's a, a type uh, typography and type design teacher um, as well. She created this book that um, is a really rich resource. It's, uh, combines um, case studies based on her own students' work and analyzes, um, you know, the anatomy of letter forms to a certain degree, or you know, to different. Um, degrees. Um, and then on that note, I would recommend uh, on the note of um, anatomy, uh, Stephen Cole's rec more recent book, uh, Anatomy of Type, is also a great resource. The one thing I would mention is, you know, um, when you look at a book like that, or actually either of these, but especially Stephen's, is, um, you know, take them with a grain of salt. It can be very daunting to look at the precision of these historic um, models that are featured and feel really intimidated by them. Um, and just make sure that doesn't happen to you. I, 
I hope what I've just mentioned isn't really relevant, but just to, just to throw it out there, because I do run into um, other folks who, who do experience that or students come in feeling intimidated by having to, to reach a certain caliber. It's great to know, you know, what uh, the parts of letters are called. It's just, it's just good to, to have that sense and also to admire the, 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 the characters that are, that are showcased. Um, but again, you know, just use it at that level and, and don't, don't let it um, con create constriction for you in your own creative process. Yeah. That's great. Th Thank those you, are Erica. two really strong books. I really like the the anatomy of type. I we use that here. Uh, we recommend it not only with all our students, but we find it such a good resource for anatomy. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> yeah. So thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. So what we're going to do is uh, what I'll do. Oh, sorry, my camera just went out of focus, but. Um, we'll send out uh, some show notes to everyone with everything that we spoke about today and also uh, do the drawing for the $100 credit. If you decide to join us for the Font Pop, font pop Workshop in March, uh, you'll get a font pack, a pack of fonts worth up to $400 from Rod, which is really nice. And also I'll send out some information on the discount that we'll have for the next week. So thank you again, Rod. I really appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Rachel. It's been great. Appreciate it. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. And see you yeah, next we'll month. Be in touch. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> thanks, guys. Everyone say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.